Hello everybody. It's been about two weeks since I really did any progress on my RPG engines, and that's not because I've given up on them. It's actually the opposite. I've looked into Unity a lot in these couple of weeks, and um, I think I may have caught the tail of a tiger. Uh, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was, and I don't mean bigger in terms of work. I mean bigger in terms of doing things that have never been done before. I think that the RPG engines that can be created in Unity are way, way more powerful than anyone has ever conceived of, or at least anyone has ever created. Also, I don't think there is any difference between a mod and a game. Uh, this is going to get a little bit complicated, so <laughs> I'm hoping everyone can follow along and give me their opinion on the matter. Let's talk about, just before we begin, let's talk about the difference between creating something in RPG Maker and creating something for Skyrim. So if you want to create a sword in Skyrim uh, and you want to create you know, a mod pack that has your sword in it, you find a sword model and you stick it in an object definition and you tell the game that it's a sword and it does X damage and it weighs X amount and it has this spell on it and all that stuff. And then you can tell the game to add it into, you know, general uh, general rotation for shops and bandits equipping and stuff like that. There, you've got a mod that adds a sword into Skyrim. Now, if you want to create a sword in RPG Maker, you find a sprite and you stick it in the game and you create an object definition that goes into the item list table and you can tell it that it's a sword and it does X damage and weighs X amount and has X spells and you can put it into the standard shops. Aren't they the same? Aren't they literally the same? Of course, you wouldn't call that a game. You wouldn't call it a mod either. You'd call it an asset. So, RPG Maker has these assets that are much like Skyrim's mods. Hmm. Well, RPG Maker also has games, and you can't create a game out of Skyrim that's not Skyrim. Well, there are mods that completely replace Skyrim. Some of them replace all the assets, such as the one that turns Skyrim into Morrowind. Some of them replace all of the gameplay, or at least all the skills. Hmm. It's really pretty fuzzy. So I got to thinking, there's really no reason to draw any boundaries here. Sure, in RPG Maker, the game dev chooses which assets to include and how to stitch them together, whereas in Skyrim, the player chooses which assets to include. But from a technical standpoint, there's really no reason to draw a line between assets, mods, and games. They're all the same. As long as they're compatible, we can mix them together in any way we want. Especially in Unity. Let's start talking tech. Unity has this glorious editor, right? Here's our glorious editor in Unity. Our monitor has a bend on one side because um, I can't draw straight. Over here, this is our inspector where all of our objects go and you got like your transform X, Y, Z, all that stuff, right? And over here is our project window, which is like, oh, here's the light and here's the camera and here's our game objects. One of the great things about Unity is that these inspector variables pop up here and on the right. And you can just grab something from over on the left, drag it over onto the right, and the two are now connected. So, I release some new content. I release a knight. This is Mohawk Knight. We like Mohawk Knight because he has a mohawk and he looks like a star and he's got a sword. And you drop Mohawk Knight into your RPG. Mohawk Knight comes with an attached script, an NPC action script. Up at the top, there is a default for his talk window. That's what gets spawned in when he has something to say. And then there's a lot of dialogue where he says, Hi, I'm Mohawk Knight. I love Mohawks. Can you help me find my favorite Mohawk? It seems to be lost. And then down below that, there is a spot. 
and this spot you can drag anything in the game world onto that spot or you can drag any one from the game world onto that spot so maybe this is a slot for an NPC and we can go over here and we can grab a different NPC any NPC any NPC anyone has created ever as long as it's in our scene or as long as it's down here in our in our project overview drag it on there and Mohawk Knight says can you please go and ask Mayor Brosenheimer where my special Mohawk is and then there's a couple more lines and you could specify a location how do you specify a location? Well, you, you drag the location on alternately you can have some other kind of interface where you might like click and then click and whatever the point is that you specify something in the scene very very easily oh and you don't like Mohawk Knight okay well you can change his text now he's saying hi I'm Steve you have your own special uh, text box you want him to use drag it in you don't like the default text box overwrite the default text box and it automatically gets overwritten for everyone who is using it you don't like the fact that Mohawk Knight is actually looking for a Mohawk and there's a preset Mohawk prefab that spawns into the game world so that you can find it drag a different prefab there change his text so he's not talking about a Mohawk anymore now he's searching for uh, you know, some lost daughter perhaps who knows and uh, and it all works because this is the way that unity works so you drag a map in drag in an entire map into into our into our scene view here we got this world map right and what we need to do is we, we we found this really cool village and we want to put it in our world map so we drop it in our world map and we just arrange it and the village has inputs and outputs attached to it over here in the inspector it's got a list of NPCs and a list of places it cares about and a list of things it can do and we just grab another city and drop it in we grab a prefab and drop it in and suddenly we're configuring a village and we've just set it up so that George the innkeeper now has a son over in some other village somewhere and we've done that just by dragging and dropping between two objects that both have the town uh, capability and it just either finds the best object or you can manually specify which object it is and it gets automatically populated it's a list this is a list several lists so we drop in our town here's our town icon right now if the player walks into the town they'll see a full-blown city they'll be like oh look there's like houses and shit in here but we're not looking at it in this view we're looking at it on a map somewhere and there's like mountains and shit right rivers but this is a game object and over here in the inspector window it pops up and this set town this town knows what's inside of it it knows that it's a scene it's going to call this scene and it's going to have these people in it and it's gonna have all of this stuff that can happen so over here in the inspector it says okay well here is a list of all of the characters that are going to spawn into this town when you open up the town and it's as long as there are characters if it's a city with 10,000 characters you have a big ass list and if you want to you can grab these characters it highlights them down here you maybe drag them on drag them off you want to add more characters drag them in the town will try and figure out where they go just because it's a list and it'll just stack them all in and if they don't have a good definition as to where they go it'll just put them somewhere that's been defined on the interior map in the scene view as a, as a good place for them to go good place for NPCs to spawn and um, if you want to you can add in another script drop a new script on your town the new script that says you know conquerability and this is a script that you've devised for your game and your game alone and it determines how fast towns get conquered and how that what happens when they get conquered and basically it says well after a year in the game world uh, you know, after n months in the game world, however many you specify, characters start to die in the battles, and it just picks and chooses at random. Why not? 
pretty easy to make. Now, I'm not sure how clear I'm being, because this is actually a lot more powerful than you might think. If you wanted to create a new game, you wouldn't have to build everything. You can go out and you can find someone's village. You can say, okay, well, look, this uh, this lady over here, she created this awesome steampunk village. It's got clocks and, and, and uh, stuff all over it. And there's, there's my gears, can you tell? Can you tell? Uh, and it's got, you know, solar panels and whatever. And it's got a whole bunch of people in it, but the people aren't defined. They're just spots for people to go because she didn't define any NPCs for it. So here's a house, and inside the house there is a slot defined for an NPC, but, you know, there's no NPC defined for it. And of course, the city actually has a list of slots. So you look at you get this village, and it says, "Okay, well, there's actually you know eight slots for for villagers here." Okay, well, you know, Bob created a an NPC set. Why don't we just drag the villagers from Bob's NPC set into Diana's village? They just work. Oh, but each of those characters. You know, they have a side plots and, and, uh, and dialogue, and they run shops. They have all of these special... Yeah, that's fine, too. Mm, drag them in and uh, set them up. Just if they have a side plot, all you need to do is connect the side plot's loose ends to the pieces of your world that actually fill those loose ends in. You just wire everything together with just a couple of mouse clicks. No coding at all. You can code, of course but you don't have to. Now this is all allowed by using a combination of a couple of details that Unity can do. But in order to talk about the depths of this system, we have to talk about how RimWorld works. Now Unity allows us to do this sort of drag and drop stuff pretty easily because that's what Unity is about, and Unity, Unity events make it even easier. But fundamentally, there is a piece that I haven't talked about, and that is the idea of a priority list. Or as you want, might want to call it, a priority event list. Let's talk about the way that RimWorld does body parts. Now this is uh, going to be a little bit gory because we're going to talk about body parts, but um, I'm not planning to put body parts into the game. I just want to talk about the idea here because this is an easy way to illustrate it. RimWorld is a lot like Dwarf Fortress. You've got people in RimWorld. Let's go back to our Mohawk Knight. Hey, Mohawk Knight, I'm going to carve you up. I hope you don't mind. Mohawk Knight has a certain number of body parts. In RimWorld, he would have, like, head, skull, eyes, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, and then you've got, like, heart and chest and all sorts of other details, leg. And this is a tiered list, so the skull is within the head and the eyes are within the head. Maybe the eyes are within the skull, depending on how you want to play it. And there's like a brain and all that stuff, right? You've got all these body parts. And as they get damaged, um, the character loses functionality and starts to become, you know, seriously hurt. And obviously pain is an issue. But this body part system is just a list. It's just, it's just a tree list. And that means that the modders can come in and they can change this. They can add new elements. So there's a cybernetics mod that I commonly use, and it adds a couple of new elements to these characters. It adds a nose and ears and stuff like that. Stuff that's considered too small or unimportant by the core game, which I should note, the core game is a mod. Um, if you go into, if you, if you install RimWorld, it comes with a mod, and uh, and that mod is core. <laughs> and you can just disable it with a click, <laughs> at which point all the content goes away, so you don't want to do that. But anyhow, the point is that um, this adds new body parts to the list. And it did, they did that specifically so you could replace those body parts with cybernetic body parts. Now, how does this list of body parts actually work? This is where RimWorld screws up, or doesn't screw up, but it's unnecessary for RimWorld to do it better than this. For RimWorld, when you want to know how fast a character moves, how fast is Mohawk Knight? 
How do we determine how fast Mohawk Knight is? Well, we ask the character, and we say, okay, well, character, how fast are you? And the character says, well, let me check. Uh, I've got some traits. Let me check my traits. I've got some body parts. Let me check my body parts. And I'm just going to add it all up. So my leg says uh, it's intact, so therefore I have eight movement. And then one of my one of my traits says that I'm a jogger, so I have an extra, you know, half half movement or whatever. Pretty straightforward, right? You just go through everything and ask it, how fast are you? Can you tell me how fast you are? The code here is a little bit complex because each leg is not plus four movement. If one of your legs is gone, you actually have zero movement, which is actually a flaw because there is no way that that is actually zero movement. Uh, as you can see, even a baby can crawl around. So I understand, you know, crawling around with no legs is definitely gory and, and rough, and, you know, you're probably going to be incapacitated with pain if your legs get shot off, and you're not going to be thinking too much about grabbing the ground and crawling, but you can still move. The arms aren't in this equation. So how do we do it? How do we do it with our priority list, with our priority event list? Well, assuming that this is an R engine, this would be a list that gets trawled quite uh, quite recursively and frequently. So when we say, well, how fast is Mohawk Knight? Uh, the body goes, okay, well, all of you dudes, what do you think about Mohawk Knight's speed? And then Head would go, okay, well, you guys in here, what do you think about Mohawk Knight's speed? And there's a couple of responses they can make. The basic responses are um, stop, modify, and, uh, or not, sorry, not stop, not stop and modify. There's just stop and, um, um, yeah, stop and modify. Sorry, I'm working out the terminology in my head and I'm not sure it's quite right yet. And what happens is these actually run with a priority system. So each body part, when you ask it uh, what it thinks, it returns a priority. And then you just line the priorities up and you call them. Uh, and that determines what happens, what the final result is. So what this is, uh, you might have legs and it will, you know, legs will say, okay, well, you know, pretty high priority here. Um, both of us are intact, you know, plus four. Or maybe you've got a right leg and a left leg separately, and each one says, I'm intact, so plus eight. Um, but on the other hand, if it's not intact, it says, I'm not intact, zero not plus anything, just absolute zero. So so you, you pass it and it actually zeroes itself out. What does that mean? Well, it means that a leg doesn't have one priority. It has two. An intact leg goes first. A damaged leg goes last. Or much later, at least. So that means that the leg has logic in it. The leg says, I'm injured, so I actually want to go later on. I want to make sure that I set these values to zero. Now, what if you've got a cybernetic leg? It's the same deal. Cybernetic leg goes first if it's running, goes last if it's broken so that it can set these values as it likes. That's supposed to be equal zero, not equal eight, obviously. This is actually a very flexible way to do things because, um, oh, by the way, the stop is basically the same thing except for when you hit it, you actually just stop there. So if the leg was go first stop, then that means that you'd have eight movement and it doesn't matter if your other legs are broken or if you're in a force field or anything like that. Uh, the only thing that matters is as soon as the leg goes, it says what it has to say and execution stops, which is important for certain kinds of things. but. Most things are going to be modifiable. Anyhow, the leg has logic in it, and this can be modded to allow for very complicated details. Like, for example, uh, Mohawk Knight here is a, is a very basic character. He's just a guy with a mohawk and a sword, right? Well, let's say that someone gives him wings on his mohawk. Now how fast is Mohawk Knight? We don't need to create any new content. We don't need to worry about whether he's got legs or not. We don't need to concern ourselves with the details of whatever other mod content we've got. The wings say, I'm intact. 
um, and I'm going to set our mobility to some high level minus our, our total weight, the weight of our armor, for example. So maybe it goes last, and it says, well, whatever came before me, I don't give a shit. My character is, is exactly as fast as I say he is. There's no need for us to create a um, permanent mod for that. The wings have their definition. So each of these wings has an in-game definition that pops up in the inspector. And if we import Mohawk Knight, winged head Mohawk Knight, into some other game, we don't have to import the winged head mod. Mohawk Knight includes the winged head mod. Of course, no other winged head people will pop up. It's only Mohawk Knight. But that script doesn't require any outside influence. What our focus here is we can try to minimize the amount of global stuff that is required. Let's say that we built a standard RPG engine, and, uh, and our standard RPG engine says Mohawk Knight has 100 HP, 20 MP, and, you know, he's got a 30 damage with his sword. This is just a way to handle combat, right? If we look at Mohawk Knight in the Inspector, down here there's going to be a combat handler list, and that's going to be first. Default. What if we want to switch over to RimWorld's system, where there's a whole bunch of different body parts, and they can get each of them can get injured on their own? Well, there we go. Wormworld's there. But we don't even have to do that. What if we wanted to have both? We could. It's a list. So there's default. And there's Rimworld. And the Rimworld one can just have different priorities. So it can catch damage that you know, in different ways. So it could work together, you know? It could be like, well, RimWorld actually handles all the damage that comes in, but then it passes it down the line after modifying it. So, you know, if, you're, if your arm gets shot really badly and you're hurting, RimWorld takes care of that damage that came in, and RimWorld says, okay, well, now the arm is mangled. And then RimWorld says, you know what? Every 30 seconds, I'm going to take HP damage from that. So the actual attack against you doesn't cost HP damage, but that bleeding, that injury, does. Maybe it costs MP damage, because it's pain, and it lowers your ability to concentrate. Just pass it up the line. Pass it up the line. Super basic. And it works really, really well, and really, really flexibly. And it's also slow as balls. Fortunately, that's okay. Uh, computers of these, uh, you know, today's computers are super fast. And uh, trying to compute, you know, which events happen when is fairly straightforward. Um, running some speed tests, it's very slow on a um, on a processor level. You know, it doesn't. It takes a lot of extra effort to compute these things. But these are not the things that actually take up the majority of the effort. Uh, and, you know, normally it's the rendering, the shadows, that sort of stuff, the physics. None of this stuff takes up any any sort of uh, time as compared to that stuff. So even though it is slow, I don't really see any problem with this being the approach that we take. We make everything into these stacked lists, and the lists get called with a priority system, and each one, each thing in a list specifies its priority on the fly, and it can change at any time given the internal state of the object. It, it seems pretty easy, and if I did this, you know how I said that we could import our uh, our our knight into any game world and he'd keep his wings he'd also keep the rim world damage system and all of the rim world ui displays that are required to show it and he would have his own unique damage response and way this is um this is going to go somewhere a little bit unusual Let's say that our RPG is set in a vast universe, and it's a space RPG. And there's all these planets that we're visiting. We're visiting all these planets. Now, normally, in a space RPG like this, you would visit each planet, and you'd either have to have planets that were carefully made from scratch, or you would have to generate them randomly. If you generate them randomly, they're going to be pretty boring, at least after you figure out the uh, algorithm. At least, you know, once the player figures out the extents of the algorithm, these sorts of things are pretty straightforward. 
but uh, what if we could kind of do both? What if we said that this was the RimWorld mod? The RimWorld mod world. And all of the inhabitants of this world had that damage system. They have a completely different UI. They have a completely different way of, of absorbing damage. And nobody else in the universe is affected by this mod. Nobody else anywhere. You land here, you're not affected by the mod. You still take HP damage straight up. It's the RimWorld people that have their own special mod bonus, you know, the own special mod thing. And if you grab a RimWorlder and you make him part of your crew and you fly off to this world, he still has his own modded system. What if we used that quite a lot? What if we allowed people to create a universe and they could select mods, hundreds, hundreds of mods, content packs, if you want to call them that, hundreds of them, thousands of them, and they populated the world in tiny chunks. So when you fly over to this world, this is our Skyrim world, and all the characters are Dovahkiin and can do all shouts and stuff. Can you imagine that sort of um, chaos? I want to call it chaos, but it's fun. It's cool chaos. And it can all be affecting. You kill a dragon on the Skyrim world, and you gain the Skyrim uh, shout capability, even though you're not a Skyrim, or because it can just be added to your character live during the game. And then if you leave that world and go to another world, you still keep it. And, of course, you can stitch them all together in the Inspector if you wanted to create a game more manually. Stitch them all together in the Inspector in the same way. You could say, this, this world is the only world where I want that to be the case. So, this is why it's taken me quite a while to get anything done with my uh, RPG engines. <laughs> Anyhow, I hope you understood all that. If you did, let me know. If you didn't, let me know. Uh, tell me what you think about it.